Last week, uh, Carers UK, we launched an app for carers, our first app for carers, which is called Jointly. And um, uh, there's, some, there's some flyers at the front about it. And the aim of, of the app is to help uh, people who are caring uh, for someone to coordinate and manage that care uh, easier. And uh, if you want to find out any more about it, uh, there's some flyers here, and my colleague Caroline uh, is there who knows all about it as, as well. Um, I should just tell you, um, we're, we're, this is the first time we've done anything like this at Carriage UK, and launched something like this. And we're learning about the world of marketing, because we don't really do any marketing, really, us. <laughs> and um, we call it jointly, and we do all the proper things. We trademark the name jointly, you have to trademark these, these things. We came up with a squiggly thing, which you have to do. Um, and it reflects very much the idea about, about caring jointly uh, together. And um, you, can, you can get this from Apple and, and uh, Google Play stores or all the right place. What we hadn't done, though, is Google jointly and see where it comes up in the Google list. And so we did that just a few days before launch, and it came up about 15th or 16th on the list. But it came up under everything to do with rolling a joint. Oh, no. <laughs> So my poor colleague then had to spend the next two or three days frantically phoning up all the people that do all those sorts of things to say it's not that sort of a thing uh, that may or may not help carers, not for me to say, but it's not that <laughs> sort of a thing. So, but anyway, we're, we, uh, we developed this uh, with carers, very much talking about what would, what would be helpful to make caring a little bit easier. So if you're interested, uh, there's a flyer here and, and we'd be delighted to, uh, to talk to you about it. And we have learned something about the world of Google and marketing and the things you don't think about when you, when you start off on this journey. You could always put a link under it, you know? Give it a link under it. Yeah, to the join. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well I don't know. Yeah, maybe there'll be a buy one, get one free deal. We can, <laughs> we can think about it for future. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so thank you for just letting me take a bit of time there. And um, so we've come to uh, our final session today. It seems to have flown by uh, today. I'm delighted to, uh, to welcome Joe uh, Mariotti, who's going to talk about reaching out or, or missing out. So uh, approaches uh, to outreach with, with family carers in social care organisations. So Joe, over to you. Thanks very much, Helena. And just hello, everybody. And it's really great to be here. And this is another project that was funded by the School for Social Care Research. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did, some of our findings, some of our ideas about outreach, trying to ensure that carers aren't missed out. And I really want to say that I've really noticed hearing all the discussions this afternoon that this is really an audience of experts. And one of the things that's always a worry, I think, when you're a researcher, is presenting what I once saw... Um, heard Francis Ween describe as the blindingly obvious school of research <laughs> and when you talk about things and I'm going to be presenting some bright blind blindingly obvious findings here today about outreach with carers so what we did it was a mixed method study and what that means is that we did some interviews with people and we did a survey of local councils about half of the local councils replied to the survey and with the interviews we spoke to 38 people who were carers workers people working in carers centers or working in specialist support posts with carers 24 family carers eight people commissioning social care services and 16 representatives of voluntary organisations who are sort of concerned with or um, concerned about carers, so pe like people from the MS Society or people from the Alzheimer's Society. And although we sent the survey to all of the uh, local councils in England with social services responsibilities, we just did four places that we looked at in depth, and they were in the East, the South, London and the North. So we got a bit of variety there. So what we found is we know this, don't we? We know so much the difficulties that carers report in finding out about services and often going on about how they've been caring for years without any other sources of support. And sometimes it seems, though, that how we've responded to this, everybody says, oh, yes, we know many carers care for many years without any support. So what they need is information. We need better information, and that's going to lead to better outcomes. Well, of course... 
sometimes solutions are not always that simple. So you end up, you know, we all know how um, Helena spoke about Googling, um, Googling jointly a few minutes ago. We all know now that if we Googled carers, we'd come up with millions upon millions and if you were sitting there at home and you were worried about you know you were caring for somebody you didn't have a lot of time you were feeling quite stressed and anxious you don't really have all that time to go through all these millions and millions of websites trying to see which ones are going to be relevant for you so for instance and and it, even if you did have all the time in the world to 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 say to go through all these websites and decide which is the one that's going to help you we know that many people don't recognise themselves as carers. This quote here from a carer who said, oh, I went to a leaflet at the clinic because she'd been caring, in fact, for her husband who had mental health problems since they got married at the end of the 1970s. And she said, oh, about five years ago, I found out there was support for carers. So many people don't recognise themselves as carers, so they're not going to be looking on websites or in picking up leaflets about um, support for carers. We also know that people can feel really guilty about asking for help. You know, people feel that they're letting their, they're letting their family down, they're letting the person they care for down by asking for support. And the other thing that I've really learned from this project, I don't think, I think I'd underestimated, I thought we were better on the stigma of being a carer. I thought things had really improved since I had my first response research job looking at support for people who were caring for somebody with dementia but actually stigma came up as a big theme particularly stigma for caring for different groups and I'm going to talk about that a bit later the other thing of course is that information isn't always accessible or useful I mean this came up in the previous presentation where we were talking a little bit about hearing a little bit about <coughs> practitioners understanding of the guidance on carers assessments and some of their very variable levels of knowledge and the person who said oh if you've got a good social worker that's fine well what happens to the people with a bad social worker so people were saying things like either the information's not even useful or it's not, um, or you're even given information overload. Somebody gives you sort of, you know, 28 different leaflets and you think, how am I supposed to read all these? And that's why in this particular instance, this, uh, this carer was saying, well, parents groups are very good because you'll go along and people will say, have you got about this? Do you know about this? And we know as well that it, for all those carers who were underrepresented, there's other groups of carers who are even more likely to be underrepresented. So there's a lot more emphasis now on recognition that carers from <coughs> black and minority ethnic groups are less likely to access support, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender carers, young carers, and um, Derek and Linda's research here about working age carers in paid employment. So we know that even among all the, all the carers in the world who could potentially ask for help, there are certain carers who still aren't, if you like, being reached, the sort of Heineken, I'm calling this the Heineken effect, but I've realised that's because I'm old and you have to be quite old to remember that advertisement for Heineken that said reaches the parts that other beers don't reach. So from the survey, so the councils who took part in the survey and the people and some of the commissioners that we spoke to did recognise this. They did recognise to a certain extent that information alone wasn't going to be enough. So um, about most of, council, most of the councils, Margaret mentioned the, the benefits of having a carer's card. Most of the councils kept to carer's registers and one of the main benefits of being on the carer's register was you had access to a card that said, I'm a carer, somebody relies on me. They did things like leaflets in local libraries and local contact centres. They would link up as well. They'd got much more, this was the sort of a more recent trend of linking up to national events like Carers Week. And this one really made me giggle, this response. Working with supermarkets. You know, sometimes the Daily Mail has this sort of idea of everything's dreadful out there. Now, this particular scheme that Sainsbury's have done, which are about trying to train up their... Um, till operators to become more sensitive to the needs of carers so if somebody comes along with sort of two baskets and you know they've got two and they want two receipts are you does that mean you're doing shopping for somebody else so they're training up all their staff now most people would think this is a very good thing and it fits in with the government's agenda about dementia friendly communities but no the daily mail i found this article sainsbury's supermarket staff have been trained as government health spies which i thought was quite quite a surprising reaction to that okay then so we've said we've said all that we've said there's all these strategies out there to try and reach carers but 
even so, <coughs> we looked at, um, I think we looked at about 50 council websites. They're all very variable, wherever you live. Some councils, if you log on and you see what support's available for carers, everything's fantastic. <coughs> Others, you'll, you know, you're not even on there. You can search for carers and it'll come up with recycling or something. <laughs> And we found very much as well that the, often a lot of that information that's on these councils, carers, they didn't want that sort of information. They knew that stuff. They wanted more specialist information. They didn't want that. And, of course, going back to the point where somebody, one of the queries, when Diane was talking about her research and somebody made the point, well, of course, people who've had a carer's assessment are only a small proportion of carers. And we equally we know that people who are on carer's registers are still only a small proportion of carers carers compared with the general population. So what were the other ways councils were trying to do different types of outreach? Well we, we looked at all the um, interviews that and Jenny and Mark are here who did quite a few of the interviews and um, we, we looked we analysed all these interviews to see to work out was there a sort of a, a typology if you like of outreach in terms of activities of what the things that people were doing to go out there and reach carers in a way that went beyond just saying here's a leaflet phone me if there's any problems or something as if anybody you don't do you when somebody says phone me if you've got any problems that's probably you know you've really got to feel really really under sort of stress to actually phone them and we found really there were sort of different models so the model that perhaps we're most familiar with the most obvious model is this sort of high street effect where you've got things like local carers centers and the advantage of them you've got sort of they're really visible you know often they're in uh, town centers you can walk past them it says in big letters carers center then there was a model of sort of integrated with primary care and self-help and then finally specialist outreach and I'm going to talk about all of those separately so we know that most of the you know this I think there are over a hundred carers networks within England and most of those are run by the carers trust there's some new carers hubs that are springing up which are local partnerships of um, of organizations like carers UK age UK in some areas but one of the issues that happened that was a big issue in the more rural place that we where we looked did our research was well actually there isn't the infrastructure you know if you've got a, a small population and you don't actually have enough people to justify building a big center and people live far away and they don't necessarily come into town every week so they'd set up some of these carers cafes which uh, photo that Jenny and Mark did and the advantage for them if you like was that obviously that was an approach that worked that, that perhaps was more geared towards rural areas where you have travelling advice sessions where within a local library you might have one day a week or one day a month where something comes in or another centre sometimes another somebody else spoke about doing sessions in the local village hall but obviously it doesn't have that big infrastructure that you've got with a carer's centre I think the key advantage of these very, very visible sort of approaches <coughs> like carer centres is that you can respond quickly. They have a, people can drop in, people can ask for an appointment, uh, uh, and they won't, it's not like phoning up social services and waiting for a response. You, you can be dealt with immediately. And so this worker said, she said, well, of course, when, mo when most people do pop in without an appointment, they're normally at crisis point, to be honest. So she said that often, you know, you have to be prepared for the fact we have a room full of tears here. So that often people will sort of walk past something and they'll summon up, eventually, eventually they'll see it and they'll summon up the courage and they'll go in and they'll say, OK. So that's obviously a great advantage of this sort of very obvious on the high street approach. And um, in one particular area, in, in the um, one carer centre had said, well, we're trying to make, going to make ourselves more visible. They'd actually got carers who they were in touch with to talk to them about trying to make themselves have better signs, better decor, so it looks sort of brighter and fresher, and also trying to sort of um, improve, uh, improve their website so they could become more visible. But of course, if you're... As I said, if you're in a more rural area, there are much more challenges in terms of cost. And it isn't quite so easy to say, that's fine, we needn't worry about carers, um, you know, who a carers outreach because they can all go to the carer centre because there isn't a carer centre for them. So, this 
perhaps was the rarest approach, I have to say. I'm saying that sort of carer centres, you know, most big urban places will have a carer centre. This is quite unusual, I think, where the local council had invested in um, a carer's worker in a local GP surgery. And the rationale of that is that we know that among all of us, you know, when people talk about who's a health and who's a user of health and care services, of course, it's our GP who is the person we see more often. And we know that carers are much more likely to have seen their GP than any other health and social care professional. And here, of course, you've got the advantage that carers may have a dual role, either as partners in somebody's care, but as someone with health problem needs of their own. So this idea of having outreach to carers in primary care where GP surgeries are trying to be much better at identifying carers, there's obviously real advantages to this. And in this place, as I say, the carer support worker, they'd noticed the local council had invested in this carer support worker role and they noticed that those practices that engage most with that support worker had a higher number of carers on their register. So they sort of thought, well, it could be chicken and egg, but on the other hand, this is an area where councils can feed in very much with the health, with the, with the well-being role of local councils and helping with the prevention agenda of actually thinking a bit more about doing outreach with carers in primary care. But as I said, the big challenge of this is that it only appeared to exist in, in only one study area. We didn't find any examples in any of the others. We didn't find any, ex any examples in any of our surveys. There is a big body of work within the NHS looking at improving recognition, carer recognition in primary care. But remember, because this project was funded by the School for Social Care Research, it's all about what social care was doing. And of course it's not equally clear about how this would, if you did have better carer outreach in primary care, how this would link up to either carer assessments and accessing other social care support. And another approach, I've heard this, I heard this phrase this morning, what was it called? frugal funding or something it was some amazing phrase which basically says we haven't got any money to spend but we'll give you a little bit and this is example an example of frugal funding self-help this particular person had set up a sort of a self-help group of carers the advantage of that is that it creates a sense of mutual support we all know that sort of often when carers go to carers groups one of the things they say is i thought i was the only person i didn't realize and it doesn't demand a major in infrastructure. And there is a lot of res there is limited amount of research upon peer support for carers, but it doesn't actually appear to have considered this idea about self-help outreach. So going back to this little chap, he he went out and he just tried to recruit <coughs> lots and lots of carers locally, and he said it was just a question of talking and talking and talking until I eventually found one, and I then I found another one, and then it spread from there re really. So the advantage of that is that you've got credibility, you've got flexibility. From a local council's perspective, it requires minimal resources. He just got a small grant from the local council to hold meetings and publicity. There's also potential, I think, for this sort of idea of more giving carers sort of self-help groups, more en encouragement to find other groups of carers in, in similar positions, is that you can also link it up with other carer-led initiatives. So, for instance, like local carers' councils or carers' forums. But, of course, it's very dependent upon individuals. And particularly, um, I'm very conscious of the fact that within local councils there's been this big trend away from grants to contracts so, and that may hinder expansion of this model because this model is very much dependent upon giving somebody a grant and in terms of accountability and in terms of outcomes. If you give somebody, you know, a couple of hundred pounds a year and a book of stamps, you can't really complain if at the end of the year he hasn't, you know, attracted, um, you know, some, I mean, the Alzheimer's Society are doing a project called Connecting Communities at the moment, which is about trying to improve um, awareness of dementia among people from black and minority ethnic groups. And each of the volunteers has got a target in the terms of the number of speeches they've got to give, the number of people they've got to reach. But if you're going to have this model where you only give a carer sort of a book of stamps, you can't really turn around and say, you haven't met your targets, we're not giving you a book of stamps next year. <laughs> which is where specialist outreach comes in. 
And in some ways, that was the model of outreach that fits in with most other research about, about outreach. And it's particularly important, I think, this idea of specialist outreach, where we know that there's stigma about caring or there's lack of an awareness. So, for instance, um, you, one of the things that... Um, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So, for instance, one of the people who was interviewed who came from, who, who, who wasn't, English wasn't her first language, she said, she pointed out that when she first came to England, she said, I wouldn't have any clue about what, what the word carer meant. I didn't even see myself as a carer, even if I had known that word. So there's a lot of cultural and language barriers at, around caring. And obviously the advantage of specialist outreach workers is that who are familiar with the com that community is that they can they will know the language they will know some of those barriers the other area where that specialist outreach approach appeared to be really necessary was among carers who experienced a lot of stigma and in particular carers of people who were misusing substances as they pointed out this particular woman <laughs> who um she, she had set up a, another self-help group of, of carers where she said the idea of some carer of somebody with substance misuse walking into an NHS place or a carer's centre and saying, one, my son is a junkie, two, I'm his carer, three, I need help, not a chance in hell, she said very strongly. So we know that there, so even though I'm saying that there are really good advantages to having that high street approach, there will be those carers who have who either don't recognise their carers so they won't walk into the carer's centre or they will feel stigmatised about going in. So what are the advantages and the potential, if you like, of this that particular approach to, to outreach, specialist outreach? Well, it's obviously one really good way for services, public services, to demonstrate they're meeting the requirements of the Equality Act because, as I said earlier, there's evidence that certain carers are underrepresented. But, of course these particular services are so vulnerable they are really so vulnerable to cutbacks particularly if you like you're caring particularly I mean I spoke to an absolutely amazing woman who was a particular she ran she was a carers counsellor in a substance misuse service she was incredibly skilled absolutely um, you know really really quite an amazing person to interview but of course if you're working in a service that if you've met her, you'd realise what a brilliant service it was she was providing. But somebody else would sit there and say, oh, look, another service for substance misuse. Oh, the, the council tax players won't worry if we cut down this one. So these are very vulnerable services, specialist outreach services. And then going back as well to thinking about what is the end result of outreach, we need to think about what's the point of it. It's not just for people to sort of tag themselves in and say I've joined the carers register because um, this was raised before in the session about carers assessments and raising people's um, expectations what happens if you have identified all these carers and then you find that actually you've got nothing you've got no infrastructure of support, support to support them so like this particular woman who said I haven't got a husband a boyfriend or a partner I never had a big social life and she said um, the, that a, you know, a neighbour coming over with a bottle of wine, that's about the extent of my social life, apart from any carers' meetings that I go to. And I think it's a really important thing. We sometimes think information in itself is an end in itself. But if you're not giving something, something to somebody that they need and that they value and makes their lives better, you know, what's the point of doing it? So that was sort of the points that I really wanted to raise. I just want to finish off by saying we know, obviously, it's really been emphasised today, the diversity of carers. And you obviously need different types of outreach to reach different types of carer. You can't just say we've got it on our website. You actually need different approaches to reach different types of carer. There's also, in some ways, within the context of the Care Bill and this emphasis about prevention in the Care Bill, there is potential for adult social care departments to link up outreach and prevention together to try and say, if we actually try and identify carers better before the point at which they feel that they can't carry on caring anymore, this will help us. This will help feed into the prevention agenda. I think the other thing we need, we need to think about is we all think about information, information, and it's great that information is so much more readily available than in the past, but we never ever do enough research that says, or look, 
you know, just even examine it a bit more clearly that looks at the effectiveness of information strategies. You know, all these leaflets that are printed, have they really made a difference? I mean, it would be really interesting to compare, say, the actual value of one outreach worker who compared to sort of 20 boxes of leaflets and we never really do that sort of cost effectiveness research. So just to finish off by saying thanks again to the school and thanks again to all the lovely people who helped us take part in the project, all the people who were interviewed, the people who helped with interviewing and the people who helped with transcribing and the advisory group and to you for listening. Joe, thank you very much in, indeed, and uh, again, a, a really interesting presentation, and uh, I enjoyed the, the quotes uh, in that, which really brought some of those uh, those points to life. Um, lots there to think about. On, on the information point, I think um, there's that expression, isn't it? Information is power, uh, which which is true, but I think I would echo what, what your findings are, or what you were, you were saying there, really. It's... It's information plus advice mm. often. There's one thing having the information, it's then having the advice and the confidence to use that information to take action, isn't mm. it? Because you can just get, you know, we're, we're sort of information rich, aren't we, in terms of uh, our society now and, and what you get access to. But it's actually having someone to advise you and on your side mm. who can help you make most use of that information and uh, to take action, I think. And people were saying, well, you get so much information, you get information overload, yeah. you've got to sift yeah. through it and decide what is the most relevant. Yeah, I think sort of a guide to help people through the information yeah. and to say and to see, well, that is the right piece of information, this is your key piece of information. Mm. I also think some people want, it's, they, carers always say information when you consult them, but actually I think what they want is information to make their careful person better when you drill it right down to the bottom. It's, it, it's something to make their world better, and it's not really what we're providing them at all in piece on giving them pieces of paper it's 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 something completely different from that in my many many years of experience of working carers it's it, they don't want actual information they want they do want information but they want information that's going to make everything better for them and i think that's where it gets a bit tricky or information that's accurate and good yes, i they think do, yeah. i think that's the that's the mm -hmm. issue because sometimes information leaflets get out of date don't they or somebody gives you something and and then it says you know contact so and so and then you find that that project's gone or that work has gone and and also it's about who's giving that information I mean, we know that people tend not to trust government information for example yeah. as much as they might yeah. trust information from a charity um yeah. so that there's also about um who's giving you that information and, and do you feel they are on your side and trying to help you get what you might be entitled to or are they trying to make you jump through hoops, maybe, to, uh, to to access that? And really interesting, I think, around the different examples of outreach. And I absolutely agree about, you know, it's not one size fits all. Uh, there's quite a lot there around go to where carers are living their daily mm. lives, whether it's the supermarket mm. or the, or the mm. surgery, uh, as well as saying there are some places which are clearly sort of safe, carers mm. here, mm. Um, but you need those different approaches. And I guess also remembering, um, you know, every year, near about two million people become carers, and nearly two million people find that the caring role has ended. So it's a constantly a new group of people coming yeah. in and out. And I can't remember what the statistic is about how long uh, there is a statistic about how long it, on average, it takes someone to identify themselves mm -hmm. as a carer. It's, it's, it's two years, years isn't yeah. it? I think, yeah. I think like, it's two years. So. There is that is or mm -hmm. issue also that like you were saying about early intervention. How can you? What are the trigger mm -hmm. questions uh, that you can ask someone that someone might go, okay, that's that's me, rather than waiting maybe beyond that mm -hmm. early intervention point mm -hmm. where it might get more difficult. So those were some of my initial reflections. But over, over to you for any questions or comments or examples of, of good outreach uh, services that you might be involved with. Uh, at the back there, yeah. I thought it was interesting about the drop-in model because it's used in other services, I think, with hard-to-reach groups. That by the time you've made an appointment with the formal services and so on, you're, you're unlikely to go or keep the appointment or maybe the crisis has passed or something. So it's just an interesting point about the drop-in thing where it reaches certain Because mm -hmm. I think, though, that it isn't always about 
people making that decision the first time, is it? They don't drop in the first time, I think. Yes. You, need to, you need to sort of build up, decide that that, is, that does apply to you. Mm. And also you're going to meet the criteria as well. I mean, that's the other thing, isn't it? When you, Margaret, you mentioned the issue about being a self-funder. Well, at least if somebody goes to a sort of a, a little a, a, <coughs> a carer's centre or something, nobody's going to say to them, oh, no, sorry, go away. Um, and that I think that there's something, it does send out a message to people to say, what matters to us is that you're caring, not <coughs> that you're caring for somebody who meets the local authority eligibility criteria. And it's a point from uh, earlier today about it, the ease of access was, a, was an important factor yeah. around quality of life, wasn't it? Is it actually yeah. easy access to services, not that you feel you've got to measure up to some somebody else's idea of whether you're deserving. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Just a comment, really, when you were saying about information, I used to be manager of one of the Princess Royal Trust for Carers organisations, and I did a bit of research about which leaflets were downloaded and when. And the most common times for people, we, we did it over three months, the most common time for people to download leaflets was half past one in the morning yeah. or four o'clock in the morning yeah. in the day. They were too busy caring. Yeah. And most commonly downloaded one was about respite care across across all, all the carers. Mm. So I always wondered, oh, what can yeah. you do with that? Do you have somebody in the middle of the night they can phone or, or what do you I suppose that's where those little, um, you know, sort of online chats help, yeah. don't they, where people... Because yeah. I think, but you're right, that especially if you're a carer who lives in the same house as the person for whom you care, probably one o'clock in the morning is about the time where you suddenly think, that's it, you know, the person's safely asleep, I can, you know, I've got a bit of time to myself. Um, but that's really interesting, because I've often wondered that, you know, what time is it that people have? We... Um uh, we run an online forum actually and, and, and it's interesting because there is a lot of activity late at night uh, and it's, it's a very powerful tool if people have got access to the internet because they can log on at one o'clock and there is probably going to be someone there who knows exactly what they're feeling and yeah. going through and yeah. can actually provide that sort of uh, support so I think it is you know, using that online technology as well as uh, the importance of things like centres and, and yeah. places that people can go um, I've got this incredible statistic though from the Office for National Statistics, this sort of little data that um, shows internet use among the different age groups and it's something like, it's about something like only 5% of people aged 75 and over use the internet regularly and sometimes I think that what worries me a bit is that sometimes we know that f for, for people in the younger age group they, then it's very easy for them to access stuff on the internet. But for people who are in the older age group and they don't feel confident using the internet or they don't even think there's stuff out there for them, they're not going to look at it, are they? Uh, we, we did some research in Lewisham about young adult carers assuming that they would all be online and au fait with everything, and they were not. I know. Mainly because know. they came from incredibly po impoverished yeah. backgrounds and they had no internet access. The mm. only place they had internet access is if they came into us or they had to go or at college, if they were at college mm. or school. Mm. They didn't actually have it in their personal lives at all. And so I think we can also make an assumption that younger people have access, but in impoverished environments, they most certainly don't. In my organisation, we've got five and a half thousand people on, uh, on our register of carers. But of those, we've only got about two, three hundred email addresses. Yeah. <laughs> And that's a particularly, I mean, I do really agree with you about poverty and that, because I, I mean, I was thinking that, you know, if I think of, you know, it's all very well saying we've all got broadband now, but actually that's quite a big bill each month. It's and it's one of the bills that you could possibly get rid of. You know, you might need to, you've got to pay your rent, you've got to pay your council tax. And actually that is a disposable income in some ways. That's where the app thing comes in really handy because somebody else has been doing some research about young people living in poorer circumstances and they're saying they don't use lap they use their smartphone yeah. and that you and, and and you know and and sometimes you find as well that everything downloads something as a pdf yeah but actually of course on your phone it's a nightmare yeah. isn't it waiting for it to download yeah. if it does download and if it <coughs> opens properly that's another matter that sometimes we need to sort of think about some of those solutions a little bit more 
And I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier. The, the, the care is an incredibly diverse mm. group of people. You're never going to find one, one, one solution. We've been doing some work with the London Fire Brigade, actually really interesting work uh, with carers who are working for London Fire Brigade. And uh, one of the things we've been looking at is, is access to information. Because they're, they're never at a desk <laughs> mm. or the computer. They are literally out, out and about and looking at... And they, they live off their, their smartphones. That For them, so finding digestible pieces of information mm. at the right sort of time that they can look at very quickly and then uh, follow through is actually work works for them. Mm. But it wouldn't necessarily work uh, for others. So I think it is about thinking around people's different circumstances uh, and, uh, and what people need. But, but I do think there's a... I, you have to be very mindful, uh, as you were saying, Joe, about the number of people who aren't online, mm. actually, and we still do need to, you know, do things by paper with mm. real people, mm. uh, all, all of that, uh, as well as online. And I don't, I mean, I think as well that some of this research on, on information giving suggests that having somebody talk through it with you is more effective, isn't it, than just leaving yeah. you to read mm. it for yourself. Yeah. And, and there are plenty of other people who like, I mean... To be honest, it's like if you have. Um, I quite like instead of in, instead of somebody showing me how to do something, I'd actually much prefer a manual. You know that you can work out and struggle with it yourself rather than think, oh my god, have I done it wrong? But that actually, for sort of sensitive type of information, it, it, it's nice. It, sometimes it can be. There are people who will want. I'm going to. It's because it's been videoed, and I'm feeling much more. I can't speak oh, coherently. Say it anyway. Go on. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just. I'm not going to say anything controversial. It's just I'm getting more, getting myself all in a muddle because it's sort of quite nerve wracking. But that there are. It, we all like our information in different ways, yeah. don't we? We've all got different learning styles, and that for every one person who wants to take away a leaflet and read it in privacy, there's somebody else who wants somebody to say, "I'm going to go through it with you. I'm going to check yeah. that you understand yeah. those words." Yeah. And um, and particularly, I think professionals are awful at using jargon. One of the other carers workers who was interviewed in this project, she was she was an outreach worker for black and minority ethnic um, carers from black and minority ethnic groups, and she said that her her role was um, she would go along to these carers assessments, and um, she'd be quite hor she'd be quite horrible to the practitioners. So they'd say things like advocacy or personal budget. And you say, so I say to them, would you like to explain that? <laughs> Would you like to say what that is in English? <laughs> and um, she was, she was sort of, she. Uh, but obviously that she had the courage to do, to that. do that, yeah. and she was quite sort of feisty. Mm. Whereas obviously the people that it, it would be much harder at the same time, you know, yeah. to actually ask those questions yourself and and say. Yes, I mean, I have this awful memory of asking somebody the directions in Paris, in French, and and he spoke too quickly, and I thought say to him actually do you know what you're talking too quickly I just said oh yes and went off because I didn't feel that his he spoke too quickly in French my French wasn't good enough to actually listen to him talking too quickly and so I just pretended I understood but I didn't I didn't understand his rubbish directions <laughs> Yeah. That is really that is really true, yeah. isn't it? But what was interesting as well about your presentation and, and the one earlier was I think about the, the, how health and social care now how to be joined up and what you said about the doctor surgery because I've not seen that. What I've seen is a real disparity in surgeries where in some surgeries they've got a sign up saying if you're yeah. a carer identify yourself. And certainly um, my parents' doctor was brilliant and actually cared for us as well. But in my own surgery in London. Uh, there's no such sign. They yeah. knew I was a carer. I told them directly I was a carer, but they couldn't really care less. And I, yeah. when the yeah. comes to an end, it's really important that your health, someone does care yeah. about your health if, when you're a carer, so that when you finish being a carer, you don't have that massive dip, which I think a lot of carers do yeah. have. But, yeah. And it's great that, and one of the problems that we have in the hospice is identifying carers that, yeah. you, you know, and doing outreach because we have a drop in, but you know that the carers that are trying to have a drop-in also go for a lot of other drop-ins, yeah. and they're not really the carers that we're trying to reach. Yeah. And, uh, 
So by using the GPs, I mean that's another way that we could, you know, you could identify cancer. Okay, I think it's a really good. Uh, it's it's a vital place actually, um, and also actually the supermarket mm. um, thing is mm. really interesting. And, um, and the, the thing about you know health spies, it's mm. just. Uh, but pharmacies also uh, really crucial actually because they similarly will see someone coming in always picking mm. up the prescription for the person they're caring while, for. They printed it on the prescriptions. Yeah. There was a thing with the printers for trusted carers and Lloyd's and Boots, and they printed it on the back bit rip of the. Yeah, which is good. I mean, it's those sorts of things, and you have to keep on mm. trying to sort of get it into the uh, the sort of public understanding as well. Any? Yep. One one more question for Joe. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, yeah. but it's it's on the, the subject of getting people to go and seek out information in the first place. Um, I mean, the, the concept of a carer. I mean, it's it's part of, part of our language now. We've come a long way in, in incorporating it into our language. As more and more people are carers, to what extent do you think we can rely on them as like ambassadors as well? Encour encourage carers themselves or have been carers to tell other carers you, know, look, you can go on this website or this is where you get information go tell your doctor I mean, it's just a so it's just a thought. I think people do, don't they? I mean, I think that's where some of that idea of the self-help groups spring up from, don't they? And you certainly know that among sort of groups, I mean, I'm thinking particularly of, say, the Alzheimer's Society, you find that nearly all the people who are volunteers for the Alzheimer's Society are normally people who've ceased to care, haven't they? And one of the things they do, I think it's, I think the only thing that, sometimes the problems are to do with that individualness of the experience and that if you say to somebody this is what I found you should do this sometimes the person might f not perhaps be quite the same as you you know it, it's I think it does need sort of quite careful quite careful handling I, c I can think of one one person that I interviewed for a, another project where she spoke about recruiting people and sometimes she said she found that with people who'd been former carers it was quite hard for them to tread that role and it's a sort of a you know not exploiting people for for that for what they've done but equally oh my dear it, she said that sometimes they needed a bit of help on on things like being, being non-judgmental and and not and you know not doing th and, and not just saying just because I did it this way that that's the right way to do it I think I think it's difficult but we know that many people who do become activists are are actually are, are people who've, who who are former carers and obviously in some ways that is a that is a that that is a huge potential but I think as Helena says there will be so many people who are new and from you know different groups that don't share that cultural expectation of this is who a carer is I mean one of the things that I found this I, that I sometimes use in presentations this really funny picture from the Daily Telegraph and it was from a, a, a an article about caring and it was a picture of this really rather sophisticated older woman she had long straight grey hair and a really slightly worried look on her face and she did look really rather marvellous uh, but she did have a slightly worried look on her face and I, and it was look you looked at that and you think well if you didn't fit into that image, <laughs> if you weren't a sort of, I mean, if you didn't, you, you, would you think, oh, I'm a carer? And you wouldn't because it, she looked like such a very stereotyped sort of person. I think that's sort of part of the complexities of reaching out to people, isn't it? Yeah, it's just, I mean, we, we in Carers UK are increasingly uh, working with uh, carers who are volunteering with us uh, to help other carers or, or, or former carers. Um, and I think, uh, well, Margaret might want to comment, but I think it's partly about the training and support oh, yeah. that, that you give. Because exactly. it's like any other role, yeah. you, you do you need that, yeah. and you need to be able to step back. You need to use yeah. your own experience, but also be able to step back. But certainly one of the things we hear a lot, and I'm sure others uh, as well, is um, Kelsey say, I don't want anyone to go through what I had to go through. Mm -hmm. And quite often it is part, particularly after a caring role ends, it's part of a, almost a healing process mm -hmm. sometimes uh, as well. So I think there is great value in peer support but you do you need you need to support that in the way that you support any other uh, voluntary activity because um, people are, are giving of their time but also um, it can be a very emotionally draining relationship can't it I suppose that sorry sorry 
Well, Say that, Margaret. Um, I think there are two aspects to that. With Carers UK, we have training. We come together. I've only become an ambassador fairly recently. That's tremendous value because we're all so different. You know, there's a diversity in the ambassadors, and we feed off each other. But another experience within the caring cafe, which I go to, we used to have past carers coming for quite a few years because you picked up this issue about past carers. They've given so much to their caring role. You know, they sometimes have nothing in their lives when they um, are no longer carers. Particularly, well, I wouldn't say particularly, but older people, they're probably very fragile. They're mm -hmm. elderly and they've got nothing in their lives. But because of funding, we, we, are not a, we only have them there for a year, and then they're sort of yeah. sent off, you yeah. know, I'm afraid, directed yeah. maybe, but it's been a real loss. But it's been a real loss to the people that come to the Caring Calf, because they miss that experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually a loss. It is in a collective environment, so they're not sort of giving individual yeah. ab advice, which is sort of protective. But I would say that past carers can be enormously beneficial in yeah. the community. And let's face it, there are probably thousands of them helping their neighbours oh, in yeah, an informal yeah. way. Yeah. So you can't, one can't really generalise. I think it's... But they're a resource, I think. I think it is, though, about not using... I think it is that point about training and support, isn't it? If something goes wrong, it's not the carer's fault. It's the lack of support they were given for that role. It doesn't mean it was their fault. I think the same thing happens with user and carer involvement in any in wider in services, doesn't it? That often we know that people do it because they say, oh yes, it's a good thing to do, but then they don't set up an infrastructure to support it. So then people feel they've had a, a negative experience. Like dementia friends. Yeah. You know, yeah. champions and all yeah. that. It's yeah. a, you know, a great big um, initiative, but it you're, you're trained to do it, or yeah. you go to the information session and you're told very clearly you are not an expert just because you've been to an information session. Yeah. You know, you've got to have that understanding. Yeah, comment there, but, and but then, yeah. then a few years ago, I was involved in the expert carers program, oh, yeah. which we used to get <laughs> former carers, they used to be trained and they used to go out and do that, and the government put so much money yeah. into that. At millions and and it failed spectacularly I think York did the evaluation of it and they just didn't get the take up and didn't get the dissemination and when we first heard about it we thought this is fantastic because we used our <coughs> former carers to go out and there and do support and then he had this training and they used to meet up and the government ploughed millions wasn't it into it and, and it failed. And it's now they've got an online version that you can do yourself and print off a certificate because that's part of your education and training is it? <laughs> if you want to have something to do as a carer when you've got time. But it, it, we rolled that out for a couple of years, this expert carers program. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, I just had a, a thought about the outreach because um, we did a study before Joe's study a few years ago on drug and alcohol users and we asked people about support. They did mention GPs, but one we were surprised at was they, some people said they got most support from the police. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, which isn't something that yeah, I just yeah. suddenly remember. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah. Okay, Joe, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Um, we're sort of coming to the end of our day together, so I just wanted to check, is there anyone else who's got something they've really wanted to say all day and not had the opportunity to do so, whether it's a question or a comment or thought that you want to leave the rest of us with. So I just want to check if there's anything else anyone wants to, to raise or, or say. Now's your time. Okay, well it just leaves uh, me to say some thank yous then. Um, to David and Colin for, for organising uh, what's been a really uh, good uh, and interesting day. To Joe and all the speakers uh, who've given their time and really interesting presentations. I think if you've had a uh, a really good diverse range of, of inputs and, and really interesting uh, discussion. Um, Got to thank Frank, our cameraman, I reckon. <laughs> um, we'll see the fruits of his work uh, in due course, if we, if we dare look. <laughs> um, but, but thank you for being so unobtrusive uh, uh, today. I don't know if you're available for weddings or baptisms. Or <laughs> um, uh, and to thank you all of you for uh, contributing um, to what's been a really interesting day um, for your experience and, and questions. So. Thank you very much. Hope you found it useful and have a very safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, pleasure. 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 Pleasure.